Glug the Gulper for Shaman. 7 mana 3 5 Beast with Colossal plus 3. After a friendly minion dies, gain its original stats. It summons 3 copies of Glug's Tail, which are 2 twos with Taunt. So the idea is you play Glug, they have to punch through all the tails to get to Glug. Glug will gain plus 6 plus 6, being a 9 11, which is pretty big. Uh, you can also, the turn you play Glug, trade off minions that you hadn't play already, so in theory it can get even bigger. But at the end of the day, it's really just a big pile of stats that's either pretty easy to remove or pretty easy to ignore. If you don't trade things off the turn you play it, then the whole board can just be wiped by something like a Flame Strike. Or they can just play like Consecration, kill all the tails, and just ignore the 9 power minion. I mean, if you're behind on board when you play this, it just doesn't really accomplish that much, I think. It's not really like a giggling inventor, where it just has so many obnoxious things to get through, because there's no divine shields to protect the taunts, so they just get cleared and you get hit in the face. Um, I think this card's really mediocre. Even the, uh, like the best case scenario where you just make a big minion, then it just like dies to shadow or death or whatever the best removal spell for a big, uh, big minion in the format is. So yeah, I'm not a big fan of Glug. Glaive Shark for Demon Hunter. 4 mana 4, 3 Beast with Battle Cry. If your hero attacked this turn, deal 2 damage to all enemies. So on turn 4, dealing 2 damage to all enemies is not great, but it's still pretty good. This is like the last turn where you're happy to be dealing this amount of damage as an AoE. Um, if you have to hero power with this, you're not going to be able to do it until turn 5. But Demon Hunter, of course, does have access to weapons that you'll be able to set up before this. And uh, be able to activate the effect on curve, which I think is pretty good. And if I'm not mistaken, Demon Hunter doesn't really have access to great board clears at the moment. Demon Hunter's set is kind of up in the air since they haven't really had anything rotate out of standard yet. So, like, there's a decent chance any of their Ashes of Outlands cards could uh, end up in the core set. But at the moment, Immolation Aura and Fell Screen Blast are set to rotate. So, they might be pretty interested in a cheap board clear like the Glaive Shark. I mean, maybe they are just quest decks. And as a quest deck, you uh, just don't really want to be playing a 4-mana minion. But it's definitely a strong card. Even could see play in that deck. Just pretty good all around. I think any Demon Hunter deck that plays cheap weapons is interested in this. Smothering Starfish. 3 mana 2 4 beast. With battle cry, silence all other minions. How far we've come from Iron Beak Owl. Of course, this does silence your own minions, which is sometimes bad. But I think you can find good ways to play it where it doesn't hurt you too much. And just in general, I think this card is really, really strong. Um, Paladin plays all sorts of buff stuff that would be really good to silence. Um, even Face Hunter plays buff stuff now with uh, like Doggy Biscuit and Ramming Mount. Priests play buff things. Druids play buff things. Even outside of buff things, it's pretty good for countering something like a uh, Rattle Gore, which is rotating, but it's just always the big idiot that comes to mind. Um, it's also a good counter to Freeze Shaman. They freeze your board to Snowfall Guardian. You just freeze everything. Your stuff gets to attack and you shrink the Snowfall Guardian. So it's just generally like kind of hard to imagine a matchup where this card does nothing. And in some matchups, it just like straight up wins the game on the spot. And it's competitively costed. So I have to imagine this card probably sees a lot of play. Any Storm Coil, Neutral Legendary. 5 mana, 4-4, four, four. with Battle Cry, choose a friendly mech, summon a copy of it with Rush, Wind Fury, and Divine Shield. So, really powerful effect potentially, but I do have some problems with it. Uh, most notably, the current mech pool is kind of garbage, and a lot of it's rotating, so it's hard to imagine really finding a target with this card at the moment. But, of course... They are adding more mechs in the upcoming expansion, right? But realistically, of the like 90 or so cards that have been revealed so far, very few of them are mechs. And they're really only in uh, Paladin and Mage. And even with those, none of them are like super, super good with any Stormcaller. 
And you also pretty much need something to survive going into your turn 5 for this to be good. If you just combo this with like, I mean say they add Mecharoo to the core set. It's not good to play this on turn 6 and target a Mecharoo to give it Rush, Wind Fury, and Divine Shield. It's just not powerful. So even if there are good mechs in standard, only specific, only like big good mechs really benefit from this. So I think it has a lot going against it. But obviously if they print like a 4-4 Divine Shield mech or something that's really hard to deal with, that's very likely living into turn 5 and you have a consistent target for this, then like yeah, that's pretty good. Or if they make, uh, I mean I guess they already have a giant mech minion. But if they make something like Clockwork Giant that can actually get down being reduced to zero, then that would be powerful with this effect. But at the moment, I just don't think it has the card pool to support it. Or at least the card pool to be, like, really significant. I mean, you probably do just throw it into, like, Mech Paladin or Mech Mage. But I don't think it's necessarily, like, the star performer in those decks. Spite Lash Siren. 4 mana 2, 5 Naga for Mage. After you play a Naga, refresh two mana crystals, then switch to spell. So, after you play a Naga, you gain two mana crystals, and then the text on this card says after you cast a spell, you refresh two mana crystals, and then it goes back to Naga. So again, if, after you play a Naga, refresh two mana crystals, and as far as I know, it just infinitely goes back and forth. So, you can go Naga get two, spell get two, Naga spell, Naga spell, Naga spell, and basically just have infinite mana. So, like, very Dark Glare vibes from this card. But, uh, theoretically, it can be even scarier. There aren't too, too many Nagas in, uh, in the new set. But there are some pretty good ones, and most notably, Mage has access to Spell Coiler, which is powerful and only costs two mana. So you can basically play it for free with the Spite Lash, uh, Siren. And then there is Amalgam of the Deep, which is another effectively two mana Naga, so you can play it for free. And of course, Mage has all kinds of spells that they can play for two or even one mana, so they can actually net mana with this card. Uh, the Siren also makes Commander Savara, the Mage Legendary, look a lot better. Uh, when you have an engine like this, it's a lot easier to cast three spells while you have something in your hand. And then it makes the effect of Savara a lot stronger, adding those spells to your hand so that you can keep casting them for cheap with... Uh, with your Nagas. So, yeah, I mean, it just seems like there's a lot of power wrapped up in this card. I'm not sure, like, maybe there just won't be enough Naga minions to support it. But you don't need to get that many activations out of this card for it to be good. You really just need to play, like, a Naga and a spell, and then you're feeling pretty good about having played this, I think. I'm not entirely sure what deck this goes in. I imagine you would be trying to kill people with, like, Rundor, Big Knight, Siphon Mana. But maybe, uh, maybe Quest Mage just does that better. Or maybe you just play this in Quest Mage and you throw down Arcanist Dawn Grasp and then go off with your Siren turn and just kill your opponent really fast. I don't know if Quest Mage really needs that, but it is a possibility. So yeah, I don't really totally know what's going on with this card, but it's definitely powerful and it's the kind of card that can like be powerful enough to ruin a format if it really pops off. Next we have Chum Bucket for Warlock. Two mana, give all Murlocs in your hand plus one plus one. Repeat for each Murloc you control. So yet another Murloc card for Warlock. And kind of similar to all the other Murloc cards they've gotten, it just seems kind of like not really to fit that well with what Murlocs want to be doing. Historically, they want to play a Murloc on turn 1, and then they want to play a Murloc on turn 2 that buffs the other Murloc, or gets buffed because of the other Murloc. They want to be putting minions in play that snowball, and this kind of goes against that, because you have to spend mana doing nothing to buff your hand, and then you have like a big explosive turn after that. But compared to like the Sunken thing, and the Dredge thing, and the Colossal, the numbers on this card are pushed pretty hard. Uh, notably, if you have zero Murlocs, this gives plus one, plus one. So with just one Murloc, it then gives plus two, plus two. So it's pretty easy to get big, big buffs out of this card. Could even have some ridiculous early turn with like Tiny Fin, Tiny Fin, Coin Chum Bucket. And then you get to play next turn like double Tidecaller with uh, plus three, plus three. 
That would be pretty insane. But it is just kind of weird because you have to like put the murlocs in play to support this. But to benefit from it, you want to have the murlocs in hand. So it's like kind of a weird balancing act. And on that balancing act, it's like not really clear that murloc warlock will have super good card draw to support it. I mean, of course, they are warlocks, so they can just life tap. But it's a bit weird. Just a bit of an awkward tension with this card, I would say. Also, this is the kind of card that wants you to just play a ton of Murlocs, because if you're buffing your hand, like, it's not good if this only hits one or two Murlocs in your hand, right? So if you have a four-card hand and you cast this, you want all four of those cards to be Murlocs. So it kind of incentivizes just playing every single Murloc, and I think that lends itself a lot more toward the older Murloc strategy of just snowballing really hard and winning the game on, like, turn four or five. Not so much this more mid-range Murloc strategy, that has to care about like taking good trades and just having good plays throughout the game. So I don't know, it's a bit awkward, but the card itself is very powerful. Maybe it's powerful enough that it just uh, makes the cut. Like that's kind of the thing, uh, Warlock has gotten four Murloc cards and they're all powerful, but I just don't know if they make sense. Maybe they're powerful enough that it doesn't matter that they don't make sense. It's kind of weird. Next, we have Abyssal Wave for Warlock. Six mana, deal four damage to all minions, give your opponent an Abyssal Curse. So the Abyssal Curses are kind of weird, and I'm not entirely sure that I fully understand how they work, but I will try to explain it based on my understanding at the moment. So the Abyssal Curse is a card that's added to your opponent's hand. It costs two mana, it does some amount of damage at the start of each of your opponent's turns, but then after two turns, it just disappears from their hand. So they can either wait for it to disappear, or they can spend two mana to get rid of it. And the way the curse works is at the start of the opponent's turn, they take X damage. Each curse is worse than the last. So the first curse you give your opponent will deal one damage at the start of each of their turns for the two turns it's in their hand. The second curse will deal two damage for each of those turns. The third curse will deal three damage for each of those turns. And to be clear, you give your opponent the first curse, it does one. You give your opponent a second curse, even on the same turn, it does two. But the original still only does one. And then you give them a third curse, it does three. But the original still only does one. The second one still only does two. So say you give them three curses at once. At the start of their turn, they'll take one damage plus two damage plus three damage. And then at the start of the next turn, they'll also take the 1 plus the 2 plus the 3. So for 3 curses, that's going to be, what, 12, 12 damage over 2 turns. Okay, so I hope I explained that clearly. And I hope what I explained was factual. So anyway, this card. Deal 4 damage to all minions, give your opponent an Abyssal Curse. So on its own, 6 mana, deal 4 damage AoE, deal 2 damage to the opponent is not a great card. On its own, it's just not great. So it really just matters how many curses you can pump out to the opponent. And I believe the curses continue stacking throughout the game. Like if you give them on turn one a curse that does one damage and then it's long gone by turn six, the curse you give them on turn six will still deal the two damage each time. So you do need to have like a certain amount of curse cards for this archetype to really make sense. And we've only seen two curse cards at the moment. One of them is a legendary. So at the moment, the maximum curse you can give your opponent is three. And you're like building your whole deck around this concept of dealing 12 damage to your opponent. Seems quite weak at the moment. But I assume they'll be getting more curses. So you really just can't evaluate this card until all the curses are shown. Warlock still has four cards to be revealed. Probably one or even two of them will give the opponent abyssal curses. So it's hard to say. Um, all I can really say at the moment is 6 mana, deal 4 damage AoE to all minions is pretty decent. So if there is a curse deck, this card probably does make the cut. Next up, we have a Warlock Legendary, uh, Zakul, Zakul, Zakul. Uh, 5 mana, 6, 5. Your Abyssal Curses heal you for the damage they deal, and Battlecry give your opponent an Abyssal Curse. So the Abyssal Curses do trigger at the start of your opponent's turn. So when you play this, it's basically going to immediately give you some healing, which is nice. So say that you give them, I mean, say they already have two curses and you play this to give them a third curse, then you're going to be healing for six 
at the start of your opponent's turn, which is, like, pretty decent. Uh, I think less than that is, like, not great. Healing for three off of your five drop is not great. It's kind of like just a big idiot life drinker. But again, the power of this card really depends a lot on how many curses you can give your opponent and how strong the curses are. Kind of remains to be seen. But even if we do get a ton of curses, if they don't come down early enough, the opponent can just spend two mana to deal, to take like half the damage from them. So I think the archetype definitely does need some support. But this could potentially be a very powerful card in that deck because slow warlocks basically live or die by their healing. And in theory, this is quite a good healing card. Bottom feeder for Druid. One mana, one three beast with death rattle. Add a bottom feeder to the bottom of your deck with permanent plus two plus two. So the second bottom feeder is a one mana three five, and then you get a one mana five seven, and then a one mana seven nine, etc. As long as you can keep finding them. And in general, I think the dredging thing is like kind of weird, but Druid has an insane dredge card with aquatic form that they're probably already playing anyway. So it seems like this is just a dire mole that sometimes you aquatic form into a one mana three five. And that's pretty good. I think Druid is pretty interested in playing Dire Mole. In fact, they already have a Dire Mole that they're pretty excited to play with Druid of the Reef. And I think sometimes you want to play more than two copies of Dire Mole. So, bottom feeder. Pretty decent and an aggressive Druid. I don't think it's like a super, super insane one drop. But if you care about it being a beast, if you want to just play a 1-5 or a 1-3 on turn 1 that can get buffed by like... Mark of the Wild or Mark of the Spike Shell or something like that. Or even just to have something that's pretty good at sticking around for the inevitable Arbor Up replacement. I think this card is just fine. And then finally we have Trench Surveyor for Mage. 2 mana 3 2 mech with Battlecry Dredge. If it's a mech, draw it. So Dredge kind of sucks in general, but when you turn it into draw the card... It ends up being pretty good. And slap that on a 2 mana 3 2. 2 mana 3 2 draw card is a very strong card. It's got mech synergy. Mage has some mech stuff that they care about. So, seems pretty good. I mean, obviously, this card lives or dies by how good mech mage is going to be. They've gotten the, uh, the mecha shark, which is pretty good. Gaia, I think, is a bit slow for this card to really care too much about. They also got the Esharan Sweeper that puts the Sunken Sweeper on the bottom of your deck. And the Sunken Sweeper adds three random mechs to your hand. So, I mean, that's like the combo, right? You sink the Sweeper and then you dredge it up with Trench Surveyor. But that is a bit weird because the Surveyor's two mana, the Sinker is three mana, so it's like kind of off curve a bit. I guess maybe your turn five is Trench Surveyor plus uh, Sunken Sweeper. A bit slow, but still powerful. Uh, the thing about the Sweeper is random mechs kind of suck. But as we've seen, a lot of the mechs are rotating. They haven't added too many mechs to the upcoming set yet. And the ones we have seen are all, like, pretty strong. So it's possible that the pool of stuff for Ashar, or for uh, Sunken Sweeper is just really strong. And then in that case, then you really care about being able to dredge it up. But even if you don't care about any of that stuff, if you're just playing a mage deck with a decent number of mechs, I don't know what the math on it is for just, like, to be likely to draw the card, just seeing a random three cards from your deck. But as long as your deck hits a decent threshold where this draws pretty often, uh, it's a good card. Obviously doesn't see play outside of Mech Mage, but could be the thing that holds Mech Mage together. 